good to see all of you. We are in our second week of our series, The Awe of God, and, uh, and we have a, a lot to get to today, lots of, uh, lots of scripture, uh, so if you have uh, a Bible, a device, some way, if you just want to look at the screen, it'll all be there, um, it's on your version as well, uh, for those of you that are too lazy to take notes. No, that's not, that's not true. Some of you just enjoy having them with you. Um, I, I want to jump right in today. We, last week we looked at, at holy awe and what that meant. Um, and the idea that while the scriptures are very clear that we are not to be afraid of God, we are to fear God. Those are two very different things. Uh, today, we're going to look at the idea revealed as we are, revealed as we are. Um, most of you are familiar with St. Francis of Assisi. He's got a lot of famous quotes. There's another St. Francis named St. Francis de Sales, and he said this, we must fear God out of love, not love him out of fear. We must fear God out of love not love God out of fear. It's the one thing that separates Christianity from almost every other world religion in that there is no fear-based, whether instilled by the deity, some are, some are just afraid. It's built into every fiber of the religion. If you don't do what the God says, you're in trouble. He's gonna do this, he's gonna do this, and it's gonna be terrible for you. You better love him. Even some that aren't necessarily so overt that way, there's an innate fear built in that if I don't do this, do that, do whatever, then somehow um, it'll come back around to me. Somehow, even those religions that are so ethereal that it's sort of like, well, the universe or the, you know, those sort of Eastern religions, uh, those good vibe religions, uh, really it's just Buddhism repackaged for the West. So if you're into the religion of mindfulness and those kind of things, that is a religion. And then if you're, that, that kind of idea is just somehow you are God and you almost are afraid of yourself because you got to get yourself under control. But Christianity is different in that we don't fear God. God loves us. And I love this quote because it puts things into perspective because we are to fear God, but we're not to be afraid of God. And we don't fear God in order to get his love. We don't love him out of fear, but we fear God because we love him. Um, now, for years, I kind of contended uh, that, that the opposite of love was not hate, but fear. I mean, all those scriptures I told you last week, perfect love cast out all fear. He hasn't given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. That, that the opposite of love isn't hate, it's actually fear. And, and I think that there's some truth in that still. I'm not ready to move off of that completely, but it does not give us the whole picture. Um, listen to this story. L listen to Jesus talking to his disciples in Luke chapter 12. It's very interesting, this discourse to me. Meanwhile, he says, verse one of chapter 12, meanwhile, the crowds grew until thousands were milling about and stepping on each other. Jesus turned first to his disciples and he said, wow, look at this crowd. Isn't this awesome? No, he didn't take that moment to sort of celebrate. I, I think I probably would have. I'd have probably gone, man, look, there's no room for even people to stand. It's amazing. He does this. He turns to his disciples and he warned them. It says he turned first to his disciples. So he speaks to his disciples, but then he begins to speak to everybody at some point. This is what he says. Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees, their hypocrisy. Verse two, the time is coming when everything that is covered up will be revealed and all that is secret will be made known to all. Whatever you have said in the dark will be heard in the light and what you have whispered behind closed doors will be shouted from the housetops for all to hear. There's some encouraging words. <laughs> Now it's almost as if, the, we don't get this stage direction here, but because it said he turned first to his disciples, in my reading of this, when you get to verse four, 
Now he's turned because now he says, dear friends. Verse four, don't be afraid. Fear not, he says. Don't be afraid of those who want to kill your body. They cannot do any more to you after that. But I'll tell you whom to fear. Fear God, who has the power to kill you and then throw you into hell. Yes, he is the one to fear. Man, the encouragement just keeps coming and coming. But listen, this is all in the same passage. He tells them, look, don't fear anybody that's wanting to take your life, that's wanting to hurt you physically, whatever. Because once they do that, well, they can't do anything else to you. So that's the good news. He says, instead, you should fear God because he can take your life and then throw your soul into hell. And, and, you know, it, it can have eternal ramifications. Verse six, you know, you're thinking, where is this going? Verse six, what is the price of five sparrows? Two copper coins? Yet God does not forget a single one of them. And the very hairs on your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are more valuable to God than a whole flock of sparrows. Boy, Jesus sounds a lot. This is the, probably the best political speech, uh, if I could relate it to current culture. <laughs> he says, don't be afraid. Fear God. Don't be afraid. <laughs> I mean, he's kind of, it's like, wait, what are you saying? But and listen to how he talks about fearing God because God can, there's a judgment coming and, and you need to, if you're going to fear anybody, fear God. Don't fear man. He can't take your life. And immediately rolls into this amazing thing about how valuable you are and how much God loves you. See, I don't think we can truly understand the fear of God until we understand the love of God. Because while I, I, I don't think anymore that they are complete, but those definitely are not opposites. Um, they kind of work in conjunction with one another. You know, it's, it's funny to me, it's not lost on me that this passage talks about the hairs on your head being numbered. And I know some of you got a nice little giggle as soon as I read that out loud. That's great. The reality is I have a lot of hair on my head. It's just so short you can't see it. Most humans, and I'm sure I, I, I do a lot for this average. Actually, you know, it's funny that I say that because there was a time where I went for whatever reason. I can't remember. We were on vacation. I, I went a long time without doing anything to my head. And I had this thought for a second. You know what? I might just grow it all back. It's, it's, there's some of it that's not, it's not going to come back. It's not there. Um, and unless I'm trying to play the part of Friar Tuck. I do not want to, anyway, I'm do that. All right. But most humans, science tells us that most humans have an average of 100,000 hairs on your head. 100,000, 100,000. Jeff, don't shake your head, yes. They're just like mine, they're very, very short. 100,000 hairs on your head. And so here's the thing. This verse says that God knows how many hairs are on your head. How many of you would like to look around a room and try to guess? Somewhere, I'll give you plus or minus 10,000 and try to guess the right number of hairs on your head. Now, here's the problem with that. Even if you thought you could do that, like you're the best one at guessing the jelly beans in the jar and you think, oh, I can do that, you know? Here's another fact for you. The average person loses 50 to 100 hairs a day. So even if you thought you were good, the minute you guessed, you're probably wrong, you know? And I know this is true in my house because I'm constantly finding Annie's in anything I put on. Uh, if, I, if she has been around my clothes at all, she, she just, she's very healthy. It just kind of comes out 50 to 100. I think she leans to the 100 side of that. Here's the, here's the point of all that. God knows, according to the scripture, God knows that much about you wants to know that much about you, cares about you so much that at any given moment, he knows exactly how many hairs are on your head. Not to mention that whole discourse about the sparrows is hard for us to kind of imagine. Anybody bought some sparrows this week? I mean, it's like, that's not a thing we typically do like they did in that day. And so it's kind of tough to sort of, uh, you know, 
it's tough to, tough to gauge that. But the hair for me is like a thing. Like that's like, God, how, how, how does he know that? Is anybody starting to feel love a little bit? I mean, we were, we were singing about it a little while ago. Zoe and I didn't plan that. The Lord worked that out. And, you know, we talk about the incredible love of God. Let, let me, let me do some more math for you. Here's another scripture. One of my favorites out of Psalm 139, verse 17. How precious are your thoughts about me, O God? They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. The thoughts that God has about you, that he's thinking about you. The psalmist says it outnumbers the grains of sand. Now, which sand? Anybody ever thought about that? Which, which sand? Uh, we contend it's all the sand. Every beach, every desert, even every golf course. All the sand. All the sand. Listen, do you know how enormous that is? That, that's, that's like a lot. L let's try to get it where you can think. All right, let's get it down. Uh, math tells us, math and science kind of put together, that one cubic foot... So, so picture a, a box that's a foot wide, foot, well, a foot deep. Okay, that's a cubic foot. And if you were to go to the beach and you were to fill it up with sand. Now, that's a variable. It's depending on the size, the exact size of the grains of sand, uh, depending on how tight you pack it. I mean, there's some variables there. But, but on average, that box, they tell us, would contain anywhere from 500 million to a billion grains of sand in one cubic foot. Um, I can't even count them, they outnumber the grains of sand. All the sand. I mean, just imagine just the sand in Florida. And you can't drive into that state without getting sand in your car. On your, in your shoe, it just, it's impossible. I've tried, it doesn't matter where you go for some reason, it just kind of floats around, gets on you. Um, but, but beyond that, he's talking about all the sand, the whole sand on the whole planet. And he says, even if you could count that somehow, you still wouldn't come up with the number of thoughts that God has for you. Now, I, I, I've been married to Annie for over 30 years. I've known her for a little over 31. Well, I've known her for a little longer than that, but like, like starting to plan to spend my life with her. We started dating the summer of 93. And so over those years, if I had a thought about her every six seconds, and I would like to tell you I'm that kind of husband, <laughs> I can't, I don't know. I, I can't really sit there and tell you like, I have a thought about her every six seconds. But let's say somehow I did. Every six seconds I thought about Annie, okay? If I converted that to sand, it would be about 200 million grains of sand. It would fill up about half a shoebox. That's it. God's thoughts about you outnumber every grain of sand on the planet. And here's the thing, here's the great thing. God can't exaggerate. The Bible tells us that he cannot tell a lie. He cannot stray one little bit from the truth. So when it says his thoughts outnumber the grains of sand, he's speaking literally here. And not literally like Gen Z talk. Literally, like for real, like it outnumbers the grains of the sand. Beyond that, think about what we were singing about this morning. That's the thoughts he has for you, the care that he has for you, the fact that he knows the number of hairs on your head. Let's just move all that aside for a second. He sent his only son to die for you. That action that we were just singing about that felt so reckless, that felt so unbelievable. I don't think we could ever grasp or imagine how much God loves you. And Jesus is telling us this. And in the middle of this conversation, he both warns his disciples not to be hypocritical, to be real, 
And, 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 and then he kind of gives us a hint into that future judgment that's coming. He says, one day all will be revealed. All that's spoken in the dark will be heard in the light. All that's quiet will be loud. All that's, you know, hidden will be revealed. And then immediately reminds us of how much God loves us. I heard another quote this week from Oswald Chambers. Anybody ever read an Oswald Chambers devotional? I've got a couple of them, yeah. He said this, when we preach the love of God, there is a danger of forgetting that the Bible reveals not first the love of God, but the intense blazing holiness of God with his love at the center of that holiness. Now see, I do still contend that destructive fear, fear that is terrible for you, fear that is bad for you, is the opposite of love. When you have love, that fear kind of goes away. But more importantly, when you have fear of the Lord, it really chases that away. Holy fear and awe that we talked about last week is not the opposite of love. It literally wraps itself around love. Love is wrapped in that holiness. Let's remember, we, we talked about this last week. Holy, true holy fear does not repel us from God. It draws us to him. It pulls us to him. And Jesus in this passage tells us that the fear of God is actually going to help us with this coming judgment. He says what's hidden will be revealed. What's in the dark will be in the light. I want to examine for a little bit here some images that we have of self because I think it kind of can help us when we start trying to parse through what it means to fear God. So let's look at three images that we have of self. These are three images, three images that we have of self. All right, here's the first one. You have a perceived self, a perceived self. That is the self that others see. It's how others see you. It's what people think about you. It's how you are perceived. It may or may not even be true, but it's just how others see you, okay? It's the perception, all right? Here's the second one. You have the projected self. Your projected self is how you want others to see you. I would call this the Instagram filter self. Okay, this is, this is why that industry even exists, because we want a projection, projection of what we are. I, I know, I know uh, we, we've all seen or heard stories of, but I know personally some people that will, that will take pictures that tell a story that ain't the real story. Anybody know anybody like that? That will take a picture in front of a car that they couldn't even afford to wash and just take a picture like hey and then it's like oh did you get a new car you know it's like, you know um i have a cousin that did that except that she was very happy she worked really hard she had done really well um she's she's an agent with i thought she was a real estate agent i think she does insurance i can't keep straight what she does she does it really well and she went out and just went ahead and bought her a nice midlife crisis. Not crisis, it wasn't a crisis. It was just she'd saved up, she worked hard, she'd always wanted this beautiful little red Porsche. Mm. And when she took pictures, she had people, she was having to go in there and go, no, this is mine. Yeah. This is my car. Like, because people are so used to people projecting what they want people to think about them. They do these kind of things. And she had to actually defend that. Then, so you've got your perceived self, you've got your projected self, and then, and I struggled hard to find a good P one. I can, if you, if, let me know afterwards if you've got a good one, and it'll be good hindsight. Then there's your actual self, your actual self. This is who you really are. And, and, and this is the self that you, that it can be hidden or even unnoticed by other people. Um, but it is fully visible to God. Especially if you believe what Jesus was saying there. It's the self that you cannot hide from God. It's who you are. 
It's who you are when everything else is stripped away. Now, I want us to think about Jesus for a minute because he kind of talks about this in this passage in a roundabout way. I just want us to look at his life for a minute and look at how he dealt with this because he was in the flesh like we are, okay, right? Word became flesh, he became man. He had to deal with everything the Bible says that we have to deal with. That means he had to deal with these same images, all right? What was his perceived self? Was Jesus misunderstood? Did he have a perception? Did he have a way that people perceived him? Was he ever falsely accused? Would you say his perception was a little far off from the reality? Yeah, he had a terrible perception. His perceived self was misunderstood. He was falsely accused. He was, he was identified. People called him a drunkard. Um, I, I love my favorite King James word is a wine bibber. <laughs> they called him a glutton. Um, again, there, there were no facts to back any of this up, but this was the perception he had. He was labeled a heretic. He was uh, even accused of being demon possessed. This was his perception. This was his perceived image that he had to deal with. He was rejected by lots of people, by religious leaders, by some of his own family, by his own townsfolk. His perceived image was basically unfavorable in the eyes of many people. Now, now, let's shift a little bit to his, what was his projected self? Did Jesus have a projected self? I mean, he could have, I guess. But when it comes to that projected self, this is how Jesus responded to that. He completely shunned self-promotion and any efforts to build his own reputation, constantly. How many times do we see Jesus saying, that? don't tell anybody? Yeah, you're healed, but just don't mention this. He was always kind of staying away. He avoided popularity, notoriety, uh, or even sort of praise and accolades from people. Um, when people wanted to promote him to be king, to be to come in and take, be that leader to take, he kind of completely pulled away from that. There was there was no facade with him, nothing fake. There was no uh, nothing false. He delighted, we, we read last week, he delighted in the fear of the Lord and he kept his focus on his father. He was always deflecting to his father. The, the, P, the P words have already started to come in. I didn't tell you to text me, but hey, some of you have. Yes, pure self, that would have been a good one. That would have been a good one. I actually thought about perfected self. I went with actual because it works. Don't keep texting me because it keeps taking my screen. Okay. Oh, I should have said, you know what? I'm turning off airplane mode. There we go. Because I know some of you, and that was just an invitation. I would have had text and pictures and images. It would have been great. All right. Your love knows no limits. Now, here's the thing. When we talk about his perceived image, and especially the way he responded to his projected image, we are actually called to be made into the image of Jesus, right? We're to be like him. And there were times, even his own family, you know, I talked about his own family had bad perceptions of him. His own family tried to push him and project him uh, into a different image. Listen to this passage. Now, I, I will say, when you read this passage, I I'm gonna tell you up front, it was pretty disingenuous. It was almost sarcastic the way they did this. But this is what it says in John 7 and 3. At the beginning of chapter 7, uh, Jesus is in, in Galilee and, and his brothers, his family, it says, was, were pushing him to go to Judea. Like, go there. And he was like, nah, not, my time hasn't come yet. Because when he got to Judea, that's where people were going to arrest him. And, you know, that was going to be the beginning of the end. John 7 says this. Jesus' brother said to him, leave here and go to Judea where your followers can see your miracles. You can't become famous if you hide like this. If you can do such wonderful things, show yourself to the world. Now, again, they're kind of mocking him here. But they're basically saying, here's, here's the point of this. If Jesus had have been doing this, kind of trying to project something, even if it was something true, they wouldn't have been saying this. 
It was obvious that Jesus was doing the opposite of this. He was doing the opposite of putting forth good, you know, a good brand and a good, you know, uh, reputation. He didn't care about that or else his brothers couldn't even have made fun of him in this way. They're saying, hey, why don't you go where people, why don't you go heal people where people can see? What does that tell us? That means he was healing people where people couldn't see? Like he was not doing it in like out to where it was really known and really kind of spreading his reputation. Now, I would argue that at one point Jesus found it fit to do that. But he tells him, if you keep reading there in verse five, six, he says, "Dad, my time hasn't come yet. It's not time for that. But there was even people pushing him. His actual image, as opposed to his perceived or projected, his actual image, his pure image, was quite different than, than what most people perceived. Who was Jesus really? Well, this is what Paul said in Colossians. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. That's who he was. That was who he actually was. He was the visible image of an invisible God. Speaking of that invisible God, when Jesus went to John the Baptist in the Jordan and said, I want you to baptize me, at his baptism, or right after his baptism, Matthew 3, 16 tells us, after his baptism, as Jesus came up out of the water, the heavens were opened and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and settling on him. And a voice from heaven said, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy or in whom I am well pleased. This is who he was. He was the son of God. God himself tells us that. And here's what we need to understand. Jesus' perceived image did not control him. He did not respond to what people perceived of him. Matter of fact, he gave way more weight to his actual image than the perceived image. I, I wanna examine a minute what can happen if we allow our perceived image to be greater than our actual image. That's to allow what is perceived or thought about you to take over and do that. If, if our perceived image feels greater than our actual image, then what we will do is use that projected image to do a couple of things. One, we will use it to protect our reputation. We will try to protect our reputation at all costs. When that perceived image matters to us more than the actual, then we will do everything we can to protect what it is people think about us because that for us carries more weight. Look, I've been there before. I've been there where I wanted that image. I wanted, I wanted what I really was. I wanted people to think that maybe even a little better. Uh, here's the second thing, and it kind of falls in line with that a little bit. We'll use that projected image to cover our shortcomings, to kind of cover the things we feel like we're less than. What will happen is our efforts will begin to focus on our appearance, our status, our title, our, the amount of popularity or what people think about us, our acceptance, uh, again, even our reputation. And, and, and we'll, we'll try to cover up any kind of flaws we might have. Uh, I, I, I found myself doing this. I haven't talked about it because I wasn't supposed to, but for the last week, from last Wednesday through this past Tuesday, I was serving on a jury in Malmore County. And I decided right off the bat that I was not going to be myself. I didn't want that. I'm going to, I'm, I leaned hard into a projected image. Now, I did that for you because I knew at some point it would be revealed where I served, what I did, and I wanted to be a good reflection on all of you. So, I mean, every day I suited up. I mean, suit and tie, most of which don't really fit, but I had them on anyway. <laughs> I knew I would be sitting most of the time and it wouldn't matter wouldn't matter so much that, you know, I couldn't button the jacket because I'm going to be sitting down. It's going to be okay. And 
And I ignored all the things they tell you about jury duty. It says, listen, be respectful, be appropriate, but dress comfortably. You're going to be sitting a long time. I ignored every bit of that. I wore shoes that were too tight, jackets and pants that were too tight. I mean, it was just, it was, it was miserable. And then, but I came in and I projected what I wanted to look like. I was coming in and I did this. And I will tell you this, I noticed on day two, it did not help that I was the only man on the jury. Um, and I noticed on day two that the level of everybody else came up a little bit. I like to think I had something to do with that. <laughs> and, and, and I plan things meticulously. And when I say that, I mean, I, I, I made sure I didn't wear two blue things in a row. You know, because people think about those things. They would have noticed. There's, there's a lot of sarcasm in there. And so I made sure I had some black on. Then I went, switched over to something with some blue in it. The next day I had some gray. And the next day I had some, and, and And it spilled over. It was supposed to be three days. It spilled over to Monday and Tuesday. So when I, I'm starting to run out of things that aren't, and I'm like, I can't wear the same thing. I don't want to, don't want that will embarrass everybody at C3 if people think somehow. <laughs> I had one suit left and it was the fanciest one and it was like, okay, and it was like the one that fit the least well, but I said, you know what, I'm, I, I think this is our last day, I'm gonna go for it. Man, I, I had it sharp, the whole thing, and I mean, I was feeling good. Even to the point that I found some socks that were a little colorful. <laughs> I don't ever do that, and I put on like colorful socks. I was like, oh, I tell Annie, look at that, it matched the top. It was like, oh man, it was perfect. And I, again, I did it for you. I was really hoping some people I'd meet at the courthouse would say, oh, we got to go to that church where the GQ pastor goes, because that's, that's what matters. And on the last day, they were trying to get everything done. They were trying to get us out of there because we had some people in the jury that had to leave out of town the next day. It was like not supposed to go that long. And you could tell, boy, they were pushing. And boy, that morning... We sat in that box for almost two hours, and um, on the outside, I looked great. But on the inside, I hadn't done the best, if you know what I'm saying. And suddenly, boy, at the end of that two hours, I was like, oh, boy. I ain't, we don't have to have breath. And I'm looking, and I kept thinking, we've taken a break every day at 1030 or something. And we were pushing through. We weren't taking a break. And I'm like, okay. And it got to one point, and I could tell this guy was wrapping up, and he's finishing up, and it was good. And it was about that time, and I'm laying stuff aside. I'm like, I think I can make it. I think I can make it. I'll be all right. I think okay. And I kind of even turned to my chair, because we're in that historic courthouse where the jury's right in front of the judge, so she's behind us. And I kind of turned around to look at her and to say, okay, now, time for a break. You know, here we go. And she didn't look at me. She looked right past me and looked at the other lawyer and said, okay, your rebuttal. And I literally, uh, it was almost out loud. I think it might have been out loud. I said, oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. No, we don't, we don't have time for rebuttal. I can't. I was, I was like, and I mean, I began to, like, it was not warm in there. All the ladies were cold, and, and I was comfortable. And, and, but I would sweat again, just beat up. And I would. And I, I was starting to wring my hands a little bit, and I, I think I dug to China with that pen in my leg, just going, look, I can create pain here. It'll take away, I can't. The rebuttal didn't last long. And finally, it felt like forever. She said, break, I got up. And already, I mean, at one point I was trying to hide it, then I thought, I'm not hiding it. I want the judge to notice so that she says, I think we need a break. I, I, at that point, I, I, had, I had lost what I thought was dignity. And at and, 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 and some point, I was thinking, well, maybe everybody didn't notice. Too bad. We filed out into the hall, and every lady that was in front of me went, and out of the way. <laughs> and they knew I was... And... Uh, I made it. That was in the morning. Afternoon comes. 
we kept getting all these extended breaks. The lawyers are hashing a bunch of stuff out and they're whittling stuff down and it, it was good for us eventually, but it took, and it was, you know, it's a lot of take 30 minutes and then in 30 minutes, you know what, go on to lunch. And then you come back from lunch when they said, and it's like, uh, you know what, we're going to need another 30. And then it wound up being another 30 and it was longer. Well, I had this extended lunchtime. And so of course, I thought it was a good idea to have an Americano at lunch. It was going to be a long day. And I thought, now all we've got left is some instructions, some closings. That won't take long. Never been in a jury trial before. We sat there for another almost two hours. But now I've got a full 16-ounce Americano in me. And, it's, and it happens again, and I'm thinking, okay, I know I made it this morning. I can make it this afternoon. And I am just, um, I'm pushing through. I'm mentally, I'm trying to, I turned Buddhist Victor. I was like, let's be mindful. I was just kind of, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm trying to pay attention. But really the closing was, they were saying everything they'd already said. And I mean, it was like, okay, yes, all right. Yes, yes, we know, I get it. Okay, all right. Okay, all right, and finally there's closing. Well, listen, now on Law & Order, this guy has a closing and this guy has a closing, right? Well, guess what, in real life, this guy has a closing, this guy has a closing, then this guy gets to go at the end. I didn't know this guy was gonna go at the end. And I had it timed out and it was gonna be good, and here we go, finished, finished, he finished his closing, I can make it, I can make it, it's gonna be fine. Again, I turn to look at the judge, she looks at him and says, your rebuttal. And I mean, I thought, no, I can't. And at that point, I had a decision to make. <laughs> and I literally interrupted the lawyer in the middle of his rebuttal closing and said, I'm sorry, Your Honor. I'm gonna, if I could just, I'm gonna need a break. <laughs> and she immediately said, oh, no problem at all. And she was very gracious. Please don't apologize. It's okay. Can I tell you at that moment, every fancy suit, every projected image I had tried to put forward just circled the drain. And no pun intended. And it was just like, oh well, here we go. And right in front of the judge, the jury, the defendants, the plaintiff, everybody, my actual self was revealed. <laughs> if we allow our perceived image and what we care about what people think to carry greater weight than who we really are, we will do crazy stuff to try to protect our reputation or cover our shortcomings. Or here's a third thing, and let me put it this way. We will focus on the fear of man. Not the fear of God, the fear of man. See, the fear of man is not being afraid of man. Just like the fear of God's not man, they're very similar. It's not like we run away from man, like we're scared of man, I'm afraid. Um, instead, what it means is we care more about what people think about us than what God thinks about us. Because the opposite of the fear of God is the fear of man. And the point <laughs> of the fear of God, if, and we're gonna discover this in a minute, uh, just spoiler alert, the purpose and the goal of the fear of God is to please God. We say, well, I'm not sure I didn't think that. Okay, let's look at the opposite. What's the goal of the fear of man? To please man. We will do everything we can because we care more about what they think. Let's, let's look at an example in the scriptures. I think that's always good to do. Okay, an example in the scriptures. Acts chapter 2. We, we're looking in Acts, okay? In Acts, we, we all know Acts chapter 2. Begin Acts chapter 2. The day of Pentecost. Holy Spirit comes, you know, pours out. Peter goes and begins to preach to everyone. Um, at, the, at the end of that chapter, towards the end of the chapter, the Bible says that 3,000 came to the Lord that day. That's a pretty good, that's a pretty good uh, meeting. Um, and this, it says this in, in, in verse 43, right at the end of the chapter. A deep sense of awe came over them all. And the apostles performed miraculous signs and wonders. This was the result 
of this incredible, you know, Peter preaches, 3,000 come and are saved, and the Bible says a deep sense of awe. Now, that word awe is the Greek word phos, and it means this, a feeling of profound respect for someone or something, often a deity, conceived of as fear, terror, dread, trembling. That was the response to what was happening in the body of Christ. There was an incredible sense of the fear of the Lord. Now we move forward into chapter three, Peter and John on the way to the temple, they go through the gate, the beautiful gate. There's the, the lame man, he's begging for money. It's the whole silver and gold, have I none, but such as I have, I give to you. Take up your mat and walk. And they, they literally reach down and yank him up. And that, that's real faith. It's not faith to pray for somebody. It, it is, but it's a lot more faith to grab him by the hand and say, let's go. It didn't take a whole lot of faith. I mean, I had faith, but it didn't take a whole lot of faith for me to pray for Caleb this morning. Had I prayed for him, grabbed him by the hand and said, let's go over and run, and then yanked him down the aisle, said, let's go run, that would have been, I, my faith, I guess, wasn't that strong this morning. They did this. And then, again, as people began to rejoice, and they see this man that for 40 years had been lame out there begging by the gate, now he's running and leaping through the temple and a crowd forms. So what does Peter do? He preaches again and he preaches to everybody. And this time, here's what happens. In the chapter four, he and John get arrested. Of course. They get arrested. They get drugged in before the Sanhedrin, the, the council. And when this happens, the Bible says that the church then grew to 5,000. The council meets with them and they don't know what to do. They basically look at him and say, okay, we're gonna let you go, but don't, don't, you know that song we sing, I speak Jesus, they sang, don't speak Jesus. That was the song they did that one. Don't speak Jesus on the mountains. Don't speak Jesus. You know, they just said, don't go and don't speak the name of Jesus. We're, we don't wanna hear anything more about Jesus. Peter looks at him and says, let me ask you a question, and you be the judge. Do you think God wants us to obey him or you? And before they could answer, he said, we're not going to stop what we're doing. Well, the council was afraid of a riot, so the council at that point just went, well, you better get out of here. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like they just they didn't know what to do. They let him go. And that leads in chapter 4 to this prayer that the, the body of Christ meets and the believers meet and they begin to pray for courage. And they begin to pray, God, we need your help. Because now they're starting to see this thing ain't gonna be grand and glorious. And you see on day of Pentecost, 3,000, it grows to 5,000, but now Peter and John are arrested, now the council's back. Uh, suddenly there's this sense of, hey, maybe this isn't, maybe we're gonna get some pushback. And this is what it says at the end of chapter four. All the believers, is verse 32, were united in heart and mind and they felt that what they owned was not their own. So they shared everything they had. The apostles testified powerfully to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's great blessing was upon them all. There were no needy people among them. Because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. Now let me just stop right there. I have heard this used as a reason and excuse to promote the the uh, demonic ideology of socialism, Marxism, communism. Um, and, and that's not a political statement, that's a biblical statement. Those movements are devoid of God. They are based on basic uh, atheism. And if you don't, they don't work. Uh, the, the system in charge has to become God for those things to work. They are godless, they are wrong. Don't let anybody ever tell you that a form of socialism is a good thing. It's godless and it's evil and it's demonic. And I say that as a pastor, not as a politician. That's recorded, it's online. Come and get me. <laughs> this is not an excuse. This is the body of Christ helping one another. This was not Rome coming in saying, we need you all to sell your stuff because there's some people that need it. That's different. That must have been the Holy Ghost because that wasn't in my notes at all. Okay. 
verse 36. For instance, and this is going to give an example. For instance, there was Joseph, the one the apostles nicknamed Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He was from the tribe of Levi and came from the island of Cyprus. Let's pause right here for a second. Just give us some context. Cyprus was an island at that time that was known for great, incredible wealth. Um, it had an abundance of, of precious stones, of, of, of copper and iron mines, um, a, a great source of lumber even. I mean, it was just full of natural resources. It was very there. It was famous for even like its flowers, its fruit, it, it, the, the wine from there, the oil from there, everything from Cyprus. It was like the go-to place. It was just everything. If you owned land there, because it's an island, you were doing really well. So Joseph wasn't just encouraging. Joseph was, um, in the Greek, it would say it this way, loaded. That's, that's, you can look that up later. That's the Greek word. And it says here in verse 37, he sold a field he owned and brought the money to the apostles. This was not a small gift. This was extravagant based on what we know about the time and where he was from and where that field was. This was enormous. This was something that, that made everybody go, oh, he did what? He sold a field where? You know, it, it was like that kind of thing. Now, don't let the chapter break fool you because the next verse, chapter five says, but, now but's a conjunction that connects a thought, right? Right, English teachers? It's a conjunction that connects the previous thought, okay? And almost every translation uses that English word, except for one. And it says, so then, <laughs> so, so same thing, okay. So Joseph brings this extravagant gift, but there was a certain man named Ananias who with his wife, Sapphira, sold some property. He brought part of the money to the apostles, claiming it was the full amount. With his wife's consent, he kept the rest. Then Peter said, Ananias, why have you let Satan fill your heart? You lied to the Holy Spirit and you kept some of the money for yourself. The property was yours to sell or not sell as you wished. And after selling it, the money was also yours to give away. How could you do a thing like this? You weren't lying to us, but to God. As soon as Ananias heard these words, he fell to the floor and died. Everyone who heard about it was terrified. Then some young men got up, wrapped him in a sheet, and took him out and buried him. About three hours later, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, Peter asked her, was this the price you and your husband received for your land? Yes, she replied, that was the price. And Peter said, how could the two of you even think of conspiring to test the spirit of the Lord like this? This is one of my favorite, this, this, is, like, this is like movie stuff right here. Okay, this is, I, when I read this, I hear Liam Neeson's voice. That was lost on some of you. He says, the young men who buried your husband are just outside the door and they will carry you out too. Instantly, she fell to the floor and died. When the young men came in and saw that she was dead, they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. Great fear, okay? Great fear gripped the entire church. Not the city, the church and everyone else who heard what had happened. Great fear. Again, Greek word there is phobos. The word great just for is, is the Greek word something mega, it looks like, it's, it's where we get our word mega. So here it says mega fear. Grip the church. And it, it's, it's the same kind of fear that gripped them when Peter preached after the day of Pentecost. So we know it was a holy fear of God. This is not fear gripped to people like, oh, they're scared. They're like, notice that people didn't withdraw from church. We go into that. Come to our church. We had two people died this past week. <laughs> Put that in an ad. <laughs> Put that on Facebook. You won't want to miss church. Last week, two people died. <laughs> we know it was a holy fear because we can see then the reaction of the people. First of all, we know it's holy fear because it's the same word used earlier. But here's the reaction. Look at verse 12. The apostles were performing many miraculous signs and wonders among the people. 
You ever seen a situation where people were afraid to come around and they were doing miraculous signs and wonders? No, those two things don't go together. Okay, all the believers were meeting regularly at the temple in the area known as Solomon's Place. Church attendance went up. Everybody was coming to church. But no one else, verse 13 says, dared to join them, even though all the people had high regard for them. Yet more and more people believed and were brought to the Lord. Crowds of both men and women. The church grew. The fear of God does not repel. It draws. As a result of the apostles' work, this is verse 15, sick people were brought out into the streets on bed and mats so that Peter's shadow might fall across some of them as he went by. Crowds came from the villages around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those possessed by evil spirits. And a few of them that had a lot of faith were actually healed. Wait a minute, that's not what it said. And they were all healed. What does that mean? That means everybody that came that needed to be healed was healed. Everybody. The ones that came, the ones that got anointed by, oh, the ones that didn't, the ones that just got caught in Peter's shadow. Everybody was healed. You know, I often hear this question. I'm sure you've heard this. Why is it that in other parts of the world we hear of this thing happening. We hear of people healed, set free. We hear of the miraculous. Why don't we see that here? Well, it's important to understand that every time we read, whether it's in chapter two or in chapter five, about people seeing the miraculous, seeing signs and wonders, it follows immediately the fear of Now, Ananias and Sapphira definitely, they had a perceived image that they focused on. They were worried about their image. And if you read this correctly, it's basically, they, they are responding to what Joseph or Barnabas did. Joseph comes, the Bible is very clear about that. It says, Barnabas came, brought this great gift, but Ananias and Sapphira, this was their response. It's almost like this new guy comes in from Cyprus. Wait a minute. We're known as the big givers here. We're the reason this place existed. We sold more chicken dinners back in the day than anybody. That's a big, we're the reason there's a roof on the church. That's not what it says here. I'm just modernizing that a little bit. But anybody know anybody like that? Don't raise your hand. Okay. Definitely don't look around. Goodness gracious, Karen. All right. They definitely had a perceived image. And that perception that what they worried about was definitely challenged when Joseph walked in. When Barnabas from Cyprus shows up with a big gift and then they respond with their own. And here's the thing, it's likely that that thing they sold was probably all they had or something big. And that's why they only brought part of it because they didn't really want to live with nothing. They just wanted it to appear as if they had done something. I would even argue that what God was upset with and the fact that they cut dead wasn't so much about the fact that they, that they lied about the details of it. It's that they were worried about what they, other people thought. They had no fear of God. Well, how do you know that? Because they had an extreme fear of man. They responded with a gift of their own. And, 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 and I would even argue they weren't really even concerned with the needs of people that needed it or else they'd have given all of it. So they weren't really concerned with helping more people. They were concerned with the fact that people thought they were giving everything. And here's the thing, in that moment, right in that moment, their actual self was revealed before everybody in a very hard way. But, but the reality is this, not all judgment will happen immediately like this. It doesn't always happen like this, not in the here and the now. But remember, Jesus says there is coming a time, back in Luke 12, we read it, when all will be revealed. Paul gives us a little bit of understanding about that as well. He talks about judgment a lot. In 1 Timothy, he's writing to Timothy, and he says this in chapter 5, verse 24. Remember, the sins of some people are obvious, leading them to certain judgment. But there are others whose sins will not be revealed until later. But here's the thing. Not only would those in sin be revealed later, 
They're not the only ones going to receive judgment. Listen to what Paul says to the church in Corinth. First Corinth, this is his first letter, chapter four, chapter four, verse five. So don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time before the Lord returns, for he will bring our darkest secrets to light and will reveal our private motives. Now, some people say, well, yeah, he's talking here again about people in sin. No, listen to this. Then God will give to each one whatever praise is due. I can promise you this. Somebody, when Jesus comes back that is in sin, they ain't gonna be no praise due. Not gonna be no praise. This is talking about what is known as the judgment seat of Christ, which is where believers will be judged. And we know that Paul is referring to this judgment because, like I said, no, nobody found in sin at that moment is going to receive praise for anything. They, they will be separated from God. So let me let me just let's wrap up in this, the next just the next couple of seconds, and and let's talk about the judgment seat of Christ, because I think it's important. Now Paul talks about this in his second letter to Corinthians, in chapter five, he talks about it, and and I think we can see in his description some things that's important for us to understand. I I, I truly believe that there are some things like this that we tend to kind of not want to talk about. I, I'm, I won't put it on you. I, I, I'll put it on me. I, I'm not comfortable talking about it. I, you know, somebody came to me one time, was asking me all these questions about Revelation. And I'm like, I don't care. What do you think is going to happen? I don't know. What do you think that means? I'm not sure. Now, that's a real answer. Most people would write a book and have charts and everything else. That's the real answers. Nobody knows I, anything... Now there's some good educated guesses. There's some good speculation. There's some really bad speculation. Most of those are on a dusty bookshelf in the back that says Jesus is coming back in 1977. Thank you, Brother Branham, you were wrong. Uh, Jesus is coming back in 88. No, wrong again. You know, there's plenty of those, okay. But basically it's all a guess and I just, I get to where I don't even, but here's, here's the thing. And if you believe what Paul says here in 2 Corinthians, it is important for us to understand some of these things because it actually helps us today. So here's what we know about the judgment seat of Christ. Number one, it's for believers. It's for believers. But he opens up and he says this in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8. And, and, and this won't specifically refer to it, but, we, but you know in the whole passage, we'll get there. He says this, we are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Anybody heard that expression? Yeah, I've used that in almost any funeral I've ever spoken at. This is, this is the verse that lets us know that, that I don't know much about what happens when you die, but I know this, according to Paul, when we are absent from the body, we will be present with the Lord. Who? Not everybody. Only those who follow Jesus. So we know he's talking about believers here. In the beginning of this whole passage, talking about the judgment seat, he's talking about believers. He's talking about those who, when they are absent from the body, they are present with the Lord. Again, what about somebody that doesn't know Christ? When they are absent from the body, I don't know. I don't plan to be there. I don't, I, I, I to, to be, uh, let, me, let me give you the most logical answer I can give you there. If you don't follow Christ, when you are absent from the body, you will be absent from the Lord. If a believer is absent from the body, you'll be present with the Lord. Then when you are absent from the body, you're going to be away from the Lord. And can I tell you, that's, that's by every definition I can think of, hell. I don't mean a place. I don't mean a lake. I don't mean any of that. There is that. But I mean that in and of itself, to be separated from God completely is the worst thing I could ever think of. Okay. So Paul's letting us know this is for believers. All right, here's the second thing. The judgment seat of Christ, it is an incentive to please God. Remember we talked about the fear of the Lord is about pleasing God, just like the fear of man is pleasing man. The fear of the Lord is about pleasing. Listen to what he says in verse nine. Therefore, Paul says, we make it our aim, our goal. This is what we're, we're focused on. Whether present or absent. In other words, whether it's now or then. Whether I'm still in the body or whether I'm dead or with when Jesus comes. It is my aim to be well-pleasing to him. I, I heard this story this week. I told you this 
This is this whole series comes out of a book written by John Revere. And, and in the book, he tells a story about how he sat down with his teenage kids at one point and was, was trying to help instill in them this idea of, of what God looks like. And, 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 he, I, and I have this belief, too, that parents are the, the picture of God in the life of a child. You are, God has put that role on you. That is your responsibility. And, and I believe as parents, God will hold you responsible for how children see God. Have a great day. Um, that's, that's heavy. Some of you just went, what? <laughs> that's on me? Yeah. You are the image of God in the life of a child. Okay. And can I tell you this? I don't, when I say parents, let me just take that a step further. Adults, you are the image of God in the life of anybody in the next generation. So the next time you want to rail on the next generation and what's wrong with them is y'all. Okay. <laughs> this is so encouraging. I, this is one of the most, hang on, this is not an OBI message. Okay, hang on. <laughs> Here's what we need to understand about pleasing God. John looked at his kids and he said, I want you to understand something. There is nothing you will ever do that will cause me to not love you. Our love for you is unconditional. And it was important for him to let them know that because again, he's the image of God in their life, right? Do we have a God that has unconditional love for us? Yeah, go read Romans 8. Nothing can separate us from the love of God. God loves you. He will not stop loving you. You know, he, he is faithful. Again, we sang about it for several minutes this morning. God's love is unbelievable. Okay? Nothing you can do will ever change the love. He said, however, your actions will, depend, will determine how pleased we are with you. See, I think we have a hard time separating those two things. It's nothing, you can't do anything. Let's go back to where we started. You love God. You don't love God because you fear him. You fear God out of love. God doesn't change his love for you based on your actions. But the Bible is very clear, and Paul's clear here. This is our goal. He doesn't say our goal is to get you to love us more. He says our goal is that we would please you. Because your actions, what you do, what you don't do, do determine how well God is pleased with you. Doesn't change his love for you. He will love you no matter what. It's incentive, the judgment seat, when we understand that we're going to be accountable and judged by God, it gives us incentive to want to please him. Again, not to earn salvation, not to earn his love, but to please him. That's what Paul says. It's our goal to please him. Here's the third thing. It will actually reveal our actual self. We've seen that over and over again. That's the purpose of the judgment seat of Christ. It is to strip away everything that we think. At that point, no perceived image matters. Definitely no projected image will matter. You are your actual self. Listen to what he says in verse 10. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. Now, the, the very title of the day comes from this verse, but read, this is from the, the, the classic amplified version. I didn't know there was more than one amplified version. Apparently there was a classic one and then they revised it. So this is from the original, the amplified version. So it's gonna be a little louder. Okay, brace yourself. Second Corinthians 5.10, for we must all appear and be revealed as we are. Actually, that Greek word that we see in the first, what we read from the New King James, it says we must appear, we must appear before the judgment seat. Some translations say we must stand before God. That Greek word actually means we must be revealed. That's where the, the Amplified gets this. For we must all appear and be revealed as we are before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive according to what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. It actually uses the word evil here instead of bad, okay? 
let's break that down for a second because at some point I said, this is for believers, right? Well, if we have evil in us, how are we getting there? <laughs> you know, I wrestle with that. I, okay, wait, let's, let's break that down. The word evil there, the English word evil or bad is the Greek word kakos, okay? And it means this, and it's, again, it's got some layers to it. Pertaining to being bad with the implication of harmful or damaging. And it also is the same word used to recede or retire or retreat in battle. This word, it, it implies a damaging effect, one, one that can be caused not only by what we do, but what we don't do. By pulling back. Well, it, it encompasses those missed opportunities. So we're going to be judged on the good. We're not going to be judged on the good because Paul says at one point he's going to then praise us. So there's going to be, judged doesn't just mean everything you've done wrong. It's judged. It's just, hey, what did you do? And it's going to be, hey, great job here, great job there. And boy, you missed it here. And when he says good or bad, he means both the good things and the things that maybe we shouldn't have done or maybe the things that, we didn't do, where we pulled back, we retreated, we held back something. The judgment seat is for believers. It gives us incentive to please God. It will reveal our actual self. And here in verse four, number four, it will help us share with others. Listen to what Paul says, verse 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, Okay, that's the Greek word, again, phobos. The fear of the Lord, the awe of God, however you want to say it. Knowing, therefore, the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. He's saying, knowing this is coming, this is why it's important to understand what about the judgment seat of God, uh, the judgment seat of Christ. The reason we understand that we're going to be held accountable is it, Paul says, it will create in us that healthy fear of God, that holy fear of God, and that will cause us to want to persuade others. Because if you know you're going to be judged on those missed opportunities, I, I truly believe that person that you feel like I'm supposed to speak to them about Jesus and you don't. I think that someday we're going to be held accountable for that. And that should not help make us feel bad. It should make us want to persuade others. I don't want to miss those opportunities. And number five, the judgment seat of Christ, knowing that will help us endure to the end. Paul finishes up verse 11 this way. So he said, knowing the terror of the Lord, knowing we persuade men, but we are all well known to God. And I also trust are well known in your consciences. In other words, not only knowing that you're going to be known by God, your actual self is this, hopefully then you will kind of understand that to yourself and have some self-awareness and say, listen, God knows it anyway. He knows who I am. And that's going to help you endure. It's going to help you per, to continue to, to go on because that perceived stuff is going to lead you down the wrong path. The fear of God is a good thing. I, I read this week a, a statement that said, when we fear God, we don't fear anything else. When you don't fear God, you fear everything else. Fearing God is not a scary or dangerous thing. It's a good and wonderful and healthy thing that actually causes your life to be better because you don't live in fear of everything else because the only thing I care about is what God says. My only aim is to please God. And one day I'm going to be held accountable and I want him to know I did everything I could do. Again, here's what the Amplified says in verse 11. Therefore, being conscious of fearing the Lord with respect and reverence, we seek to win people over. But what sort of persons we are is plainly recognized and thoroughly understood by God, our actual self. And I hope that it is plainly recognized and thoroughly understood also by your consciences. You want to live your actual self and not get caught up in the perception or trying to project who you are. 
understand what you're going to be held to. The fear of the Lord, coupled with the understanding of the judgment to come, creates in us the desire to convince others of God's love, while at the same time keeping us on the right track, knowing that one day God will reveal our thoughts, our actions, our motives. And our awareness of this reality creates in us a holy fear, which in turn keeps us in check. It enables us to live from our actual image. On the other hand, when we lack the fear of God, the more we lean into our projected image. God knows not only what I do, he knows my motives, he knows my intentions, and everything that's behind every action. Here's the good news. Paul doesn't tell us this to kind of like be, oh, what do we do? He says, listen, you can come, you can confess, you can re repent of those motives. You can ask God, he'll not only forgive you, but if you cry out and ask him, he will give you that sense of holy fear. If we do that and we renew our mind through the scripture, we can actually be blessed with pure motives that will help us to please God. The goal here is not to walk around and defeat because of what will come one day, it's to understand what is coming so that we correct and live our lives in a way that will be well-pleasing to him. He doesn't, we're not trying to get to the end of everything and have him say, well done, I think I might love you. That's not even on the table. But he will say, well done, good and faithful servant. What keeps us good and faithful? An understanding of what is to come, how we're held accountable, and let that create in you that sense of holy fear. Yea, I say even mega fear. Let that grip your heart. Let it grip you in a way that doesn't cause you to be scared and afraid. It actually causes you to lean in. Because what's at the center of his holiness and, and the fear of God? The love of God. It's all part of the same thing. That's at the heart of every bit of it. Will you pray with me, Father? God, I, I thank you for giving us in your word things that sometimes aren't easy to chew on. Some things that are hard and we have to think about. But God, I thank you for the grace and the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray today that your word will permeate our hearts. Will stir in us. Will create in us that sense of holy awe. God, we, we don't desire to be afraid of you. We, we don't love you out of fear, but we fear you because of your great love. So God, help us today. I, I pray those today that, that have been living in a perception and a projected self, that they would give up today and repent and just say, God, I don't want to follow you. I need to follow after you. Forgive me, God. Change my heart. Change my life. Become the Lord of my life. The one who is in charge, the supreme authority, the ruler. I choose to lean in and experience the holy awe of God. Help those of us that have made that confession. We, we believe in you. But God, stir in us that sense that the early church felt. That sense of the awe of your presence. We long to see you move in our lives and the lives of those around us. And that doesn't come without the awe that you deserve. Help us, God, to experience that today. And so, thank you.